You're listening to Neo Cash Radio, where we discuss the future of money today. In the studio with you, it's JJ, Darren, and Randy. We talk mining crypto with Pedro. The ECB puts the squeeze on the E's and faceless coders contribute to a hedge fund. All this and more in episode 186 here on Wednesday, December 14th, 2016. Darren? Squeeze on the E's. I like that, JJ. Thank you. So in the traditional markets, we have gold is down to $1,143 and silver is down to $16.80. And oil is up to $50.77. You might have noticed a little bit of a bump at the pump. And uh, nice. the Dow Jones uh, rises uh, to a new record high again this week. Again, uh, again, because it was a yeah, record high yeah, again yeah. last week. Again, again. Okay, of, of 19,792. And the 30 year Treasury is yielding just three. Well, actually, it's up. So this is uh, the most it's yielded since like 2008. Uh, 3.179. Actually, it's not true. There was a, it was about in the last couple of years. And then the the euro's down to bucko five. That's cost of cost of bucko five. That's cost of freedom. So it's, and then the <laughs> yuan falls to fourteen cents on the dollar, which is actually a or, it was a pretty big jump down uh, for the yuan. Yeah, the yuan buys fourteen cents, and the pound buys a dollar twenty five. That's right, U- U.S. So uh, and in the Bitcoin markets, we've got Bitcoin is up this week once again. It's at seven hundred seventy three dollars, and of course, there's talk of it going higher. Of course, all the hype. Train and the hype train has left choo, for the holidays. <laughs> yeah, hopefully, has some the hype sleigh. Wasn't yeah. there hype a sleigh. Ooh, that's song good. Yeah. written about that. Uh, anyway, anyway, Litecoin is down to three dollars and fifty eight cents. Zcash is down to forty three dollars and seventy three cents. Dash is up at nine dollars and eight cents. Ethereum is down to eight dollars and twenty cents. Monero is up to eight dollars and thirty nine cents. And Augur Rep tokens are down to three dollars and eight cents. One Doge is still in parity. With one doge. All right. Awesome. And just a reminder that you can tune into Neocache Radio every Wednesday night. You don't want to miss a single moment of awesome Neocache content, including special episodes and bonus interviews. You can subscribe to our podcast on Google Play Music, iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, YouTube, Podcast Addict, Library, and more. Wow. All the places. Well, we've got a special guest in the studio with us this episode, and you've heard him before. If you listen to uh, the Neocache Radio in the early days, you've heard Pedro. Pedro, welcome again to the show. Well, thank you, JJ. Welcome. Uh, thank you for having me on the show. It's. Uh, I think this is your third time. It maybe fourth. I don't recall. I've lost count. Yeah, I should so have. I times. should have done some research. Uh, anyway, Pedro is going to be here. We're going to talk a little bit about cryptocurrency mining and our personal experience. Of course, we're not advocating that you do anything like this. In fact, most of the time when we talk about mining, we say that unless you're a hobbyist or you have a ton of money to invest into it, you probably shouldn't do it for speculation. But to start out, we'll talk about some news because the central banks across the world are doing their thing. Yeah, so the European Central Bank said it would be extending its quantitative easing program for nine more months. The squeeze on the ease. Until the end of 2017. Yeah, but this, that's the ease part. So uh, yeah. quantitative easing is uh, where uh, central banks inject money, uh, also known as create money, into the economy. And, uh, th- what, and the squeeze part is that they expect that the amount of easing that they do to uh, be pulled back a bit. Uh, currently, they're doing uh, 80 billion a month of new money into, into, the, into the markets, and they're going to change that to 60 billion a month. But that's, that's still a lot, you know, 60 billion euros a month. Yeah, that's, that's still a lot of, in, yeah. of injecting money. And we have uh, a pretty good write-up about this on our blog at neocashradio.com. You can check out for more information. In fact, uh, I think we're going to be including a picture, a graph picture from the Wall Street Journal. And it illustrates something interesting about what they're buying, Darren. I mean, looking at this picture, yep. I mean, nearly everything they're buying are government bonds. They're paying for our governments to, in the European Union to keep floating, right? Right. They're, they're, I mean, they're helping uh, governments finance their debt. Uh, they they do this in the U.S. too, or they have done this in the U.S. And uh, they they usually buy treasuries, which lowers the interest rates that uh, treasuries pay out, and that lowers the interest rates that governments pay to borrow money. Right. So well, it doesn't seem like it's going to end. The ECB president Mario Draghi stressed that, that the bank's decision shouldn't shouldn't signal that they were tapering off or winding down the quantitative easing. He warned that the eurozone inflation remained two weeks and said that the ECB would keep buying bonds for the foreseeable future. There's no question about tampering. Tapering. Uh, tapering. Tapering has not been discussed today, unquote, he said. 
Um, and one thing I want to point out is that they, they really, the ECB, just like the Federal Reserve, doesn't have much of a choice in buying these bonds because a lot of these governments are in such dire straits financially that their bond ratings have tanked. No one, no investor is going to go and put their money there when there are much more lucrative places to put it. And so who else is going to buy the government bonds? I mean, it's, it seems like the ECB, much like the Fed, exists solely to keep governments going. Because without well, the ECB, the governments would inflate their own currencies. Well, you, you know what's worse, JJ? What's that? What's worse, is, in my opinion, is what they did in the U.S. They bought not just treasuries, not just U.S. treasuries, but they also bought mortgage-backed securities. Right. So they, they were trying to push down interest rates on all the fronts, like the mortgages and the uh, tr- and the treasuries. So, but but basically, if you think about this, they're making new money out of nothing, and then they're buying everybody's house. Yeah. That's really what they're doing. Not only that, but if you look at the most recent purchases and their easing, it's actually corporate bonds that they're they're buying up too. Yeah, by the companies too. Yeah. So well it's 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 also something to note that while some of these countries are tanking financially from a government standpoint, the financial sector is certainly having problems as well. I mean, we talk about Italy. Italy had bank scandals, Deutsche Bank scandals. A lot of these financial institutions have been linked to the Panama Papers and there's scandals across the the, the entire uh, world. It's not just Europe, but so now they're buying up they're buying up bonds from corporations to keep the corporations running, in addition yeah. to keep the government running. And now, now, literally, the bank is in charge of controlling or, or at least facilitating much of what's going on. You know, it's, it sounds it's, like the bank's more powerful than it needs to be. Exactly. I mean, I wish I could buy forty eight billion dollars worth of corporate uh, debt. That'd be great. Well, the the ECB interest rates have been held at a record low of negative 0.4%. And just weeks ago, Draghi, am I pronouncing it right? Draghi, I guess. Draghi issued a warning that these artificially low interest rates have created a, quote, fertile terrain for financial market risks, including a buildup of debt and excessive risk-taking, unquote. Well, obviously. Yeah, I mean, if I could borrow money and pay less when I pay it back, I would totally do that and and so this past fall i read where in germany one of the best um areas to invest in is companies that make safes because at a negative interest rate when that starts coming to the you know the the small guy they're going to start pulling money out of the bank and putting it in a home safe and when you have a fractional reserve banking system like we have here and in europe um depleting it of cash is is not a good idea right right because especially if not only that but in Greece's sense, they took that haircut, right? So that the, all the banks lost a certain percentage that went to the government to pay some creditors and whatnot. But that limited their ability to lend out, even in their fractional reserve system. And then that's going to stifle, you know, investment in the economy. So when when money is more expensive, uh, it's you know it slows down growth. Which, if the mar- if the free market allowed that interest rate to float, that's exactly what we want. When the economy heats up, interest rates naturally go up slowly put the brakes on and vice versa when it goes down. But when uh, central banks manipulate that interest rate and it's not in sync with the market is where we have the problems. Right. Well, well and, and funny well, you bring up growth. Well, I was actually just going to mention about the uh, w- what Pedro just said with um, countries that have negative interest rates. I read this blog post a while back on uh, FinTechniques blog, and it's talking about uh, how opening running a dash master node could become uh, more popular because that's something that can pay interest in cryptocurrency so uh for you know especially in countries like switzerland which are dubbing dubbing crypto uh, valley and all that kind of stuff there's going to be people there who take a look at those negative interest rates and start hearing more about crypto and say hey th- this is an opportunity to maybe shift some of my focus and get some potential interest right because you can take the money that would otherwise lose uh, with a negative interest rate in your bank account and, and and invest it on something that has potential for growth. So why would you keep money in the banking system? Right. And in fact, to close out this story here, uh, quote, another quote from Draghi, uh, he says, right now the greatest risk comes from impaired growth and f- from the possibility our recovery does, doesn't does firm and growth stalls. So of course he's, he's worried about the lack of growth you're talking about there. Uh, he has one more question. Uh, he, he's also recently flagged significant vulnerabilities in eight European real estate markets, setting potential price bubbles as a result of rising debt levels or excessive valuations. Again, what we're seeing in China, you yeah. know, China has the, the biggest housing bubble in the world waiting to pop, according to some of the, the, the biggest billionaire in China. Yeah. So anyway, we've talked about the ECB. The Federal Reserve is no different in what they're doing, but they are looking at a different tactic. So we have some news. Yeah, so uh, the, the Federal Reserve uh, has done 
quantitative easing in the U.S. They've done three rounds, and it's been about a full year since the U.S. Gov- or the Federal Reserve has done <clears throat> a round of, uh, of quantitative easing. But uh, now they're talking about raising rates for a key interest rate, uh, the first move since 1915. Wow, and our, our notes say it's the uh, f- f- second time in a decade, but I believe it's actually the third time in a decade, because uh, th- what they're raising is the federal funds rate, and the federal funds rate is a rate that's available to uh, it's interest that's available to banks. It's okay. not available to you, not available to me. It's available to banks that have excess uh, above and beyond their reserve. So right. if you're a bank and you're uh, you need to have a certain reserve of money. Yeah, just basically prove to the government you have certain reserves, so that way uh, the government considers you to be f- solvent. Anything you have ex- on excess of that, you c- as a bank you have the option of basically just giving that money to the Fed or letting letting the Fed borrow that money, and the Fed will hold it and pay interest. And the interest that they pay is called the federal funds rate. And uh, so it was actually in two thousand eight. The uh, federal funds rate went from zero to 0.25. So that's, I'm calling that the first raise because it was zero. It was zero for forever. And then it, it just became positive in 2008. And then they raised it uh, this past year uh, from 0.25 to 0.5. And now uh, now the news from NPR is that uh, the, the interest rate will be going from a 0.25 to 0.5 target to a 0.5 to 0.75 target. Wow. And uh, so what this means is that uh, basically the, the, the Federal Reserve is paying banks to keep money out of circulation. And that's really what they're doing. Uh, so if you look at the quantitative easing that happened in the U.S., you know, it was been, been on the order of $3 trillion that's been just injected into the economy since 2008. Well, and what does that do? What does that do when money is just printed out of nowhere? What well, does that do to the currency? Well, what it should have done is it should have uh, devalued the currency and it should have been pretty severe. You should have seen the value of the currency go to half to a quarter of what it was worth. So well, basically that's, price inflation, that's like what things you, cost yeah, more that, money. That's what you should have seen. But at the same time, what they did, and, and re, but the reason you didn't see that is because, I mean, prices have gone up, but they haven't gone up that dramatically is, is what I'm saying. But the reason you didn't see that is they raised this federal funds rate to 0.25%. And while about $3 trillion was being injected into the economy, $4.2 trillion was being sopped up uh, in the, uh, by the banks in this excess reserve. So, so there's about $2.4 trillion, last time I checked, of money that's getting paid this quarter percent interest, now half a percent, and it will be three quarters of a percent. So... Uh, one thing that really bugs me about this is there's kind of a, there's got to be a limit on how high this interest rate can be because, okay, let's just say the banks are happy to keep 4.2 trillion or 2.4 trillion there. And, um, but it, as the interest rate goes up and up and up, then the federal reserve has to come up with that money to pay that interest. And of course the federal reserve can make money, but still at the same time, there's got to be a limit on how much you can just make uh, this is basically an expense of the Federal Reserve. Of course, they buy bonds and stuff, usually at a higher interest rate, so they're still making a profit. So I don't, you, you shouldn't feel sorry for these these fellows no, and, and ladies. But uh, so well, they're, I, they're almost like they're almost playing with debt in a new way. In yeah. This, in this, instead of like the consequences of inflating a currency by just printing money should happen right away when the currency when that money enters the market, like li- liquid. Okay, and then. They they take this sponge, the the federal funds reserve, uh, federal and, excess and, reserves, and yeah. they they use the sponge to suck up that li- liquidity, and so that it doesn't harm the markets and it doesn't get felt. But they continue to send that money out and continue to sponge it up, and it's sort of insidious to think about the fact that they're delaying that that guillotine that potentially sits there. If two point four trillion dollars entered the supply entered the supply right now. If they took that rate to zero and the banks all decided, okay, well, we're going to take it out of there, that would that would uh, take our current supply of money and almost triple it. Yeah, yeah. You'd be paying like ten dollars for a jar of peanut butter. That's right. Yeah, easy. Yeah, but uh, gallon of gas is is, is seven eight dollars. But but what you're seeing is that basically there's there's this federal funds rate that's a bribe to the banks. It's it's paying money. It, 
for kind of a for a service to borrow the money, but let's just call it a bribe. It's a bribe to the banks to keep their money. And you're seeing that they're having to raise the price of that bribe as, as time goes yep. on. The banks are less and less likely to keep their two point four trillion in this account. And uh and so so they they're trying to counteract that and raise the federal funds rate. This I mean and, and here's here's is my what I'm so critical about and and I think it's reasonable is that the Federal Reserve is on one hand, and in the tentacles of the Federal Reserve, on one hand, it is it is making the government capable of existing while, while doing things that cause it to run out of money and not be able to do those things anymore, right? Like war and all, ki- all kinds of stuff like that. So it's funding a government that should have ran out of money. It is then paying for businesses that are, are quote-unquote, too big to fail so that they, they can keep going. It's taking that what what they've done to the market and it's hiding it for now in, in a deep hole that keeps getting deeper with the percentage rate, mm-hmm. and then and in, and the whole time it's supposed to be acting in the best interests of the currency and the country and you know that all the economy and stuff like that, but it's actively doing the opposite. It's actively destroying the economy and and delaying that inevitable crunch time. And and they're not really accountable. I mean, you know, trying to get an audit of the Federal Reserve is a big political feat. Um, right. It hasn't happened. And you're creating debt for future generations. That's, it, that's it, the thing that bothers me most about well, all debt of this. And consequences. Not only is there debt created, mm-hmm. but there's the consequences of inflating the currency that still haven't happened yet. That's the new debt that I'm talking about. The new debt is time. It's like you should have already suffered from this this decision, but you've delayed that. And you are going to have to suffer from it later because at some point in time, that currency is going to enter the market. Well, we talked about this a couple weeks ago on episode 183. Um, <clears throat> the, the U.S. national debt <clears throat> excuse me, is quickly approaching $21 trillion. Um, and the federal interest rate before the, the, the big crash and the recession was up at about 5.25%. And as an average, since it, since the Federal Reserve has been reporting these numbers since 1984, it's been around 6%. <clears throat> if the interest rate ever returned to even 5% and the debt is $21 trillion, U.S. taxpayers will be paying more than a trillion dollars a year in interest alone. Right. So it's that that's the debt now, to future bring, generations. And then bring into, a, bring into this the fact that, okay, Obama and all those plans are still going, and if Trump and his administration is going to stop them, it might take some time, unless there's executive orders that can do it. Bring in the fact that he's going to want to cut taxes to make businesses happy. He's going to cut a lot of different taxes across the board because that's his party stance, right? That's that's his whole thing. So not only are, is this debt going to go up and the interest payment going to go up, but now look towards the future, you're going to have less collected too. Yeah, and we talked about a couple couple weeks ago as well is that Trump's going to be able to submit nominations for uh, two of the federal uh, reserves board of governor seats and for the vice chair of supervision, which basically oversees all of the U.S.'s biggest banks. Uh, Janet Yellen's term as chair is going to end in February 2018, and uh, the vice chairman Stanley Fisher is going to retire in June of 2018. So Trump is actually going to be filling four of the seven Federal Reserve governor chairs during his first term. If well, hopefully first and only. <laughs> right. Well, we talk about the future of money here on Neocash Radio, and you can check out our blog at neocashradio.com. And the future of money when it comes to fiat from the European Central Bank or the Federal Reserve does not look good. We, we do not give you advice to buy or sell things, but I want to say that the future of the dollar, it can't be that good. Yes, it's, it, it could be going up now because of the hype behind Trump and how everybody else is failing. Maybe the dollar isn't going up. Maybe everybody else is just doing much worse than they thought they were, right? Maybe everybody is failing. And, and, the, and the concern, the concern with the dollar is it's the world's reserve currency, at least, you know, still right now. So when you have a hyper, if you have anything near a hyperinflation event with the U.S. dollar, it's going to send ripples or, or tsunamis throughout the world and affect other economies. And it's going to have, you know, a big, a, a huge impact, much more so if it was another country's currency. And, and I that's see, why we're seeing Russia and China buying gold, gold, gold. They're buying gold. They're also coming up with uh, baskets of currencies to try to supplement and muscle in on being the world's reserve currency because they're using the you know mutual fund approach. Well, this basket of currencies is less risky compared to one currency, even if that one currency is the dollar. Right. I saw a recent headline this last week that, that gave, gave me a very strong nostalgia to previous times. Remember? The, he- the headline was that Turkey was going to sell... Goods and, and oil and all, all kinds of other things, whatever it was going to sell, it was going to stop using dollars and start using local currencies. 
So whether it was the Turkish currency or whatever local currency in the region, it was not going to use dollars anymore. I remember hearing a show where it mentioned the benefit to the U.S. economy because it has the world's reserve currency is about $20 billion a year. So like in, not free, but an advantage that we have, and we're going to, you know, we're going to lose that. But that's not really what I'm concerned about. I'm more concerned with, you know, a massive devaluation of the dollar and how so much of the world's business is done in dollars and what impact, you know, that can have around the world. And then it'll come back and impact us. You know, if Europe economies start failing and, 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 you know, lots of job, jobless rates, then that's going to come back and impact us because they're not going to be buying our things. Exactly. I'm trying well, to think of a precedent for something like this in Rome, maybe. The precedent for selling, <laughs> like, oh, you right, no, I agree. You have to go back to Rome. Oh, right. <laughs> but, but what I go back to with the Turkey thing is that the last time this happened was Gaddafi. Yeah. And the time before that was Saddam. Yeah. So the last time anyone in the Middle Eastern region wanted to sell oil for anything other than dollars, their country got invaded and they got killed. Yeah. So under, keep, that, under keep that in mind. Guises, I mean, of course. we have to we have to be real with this. We can't ignore. We can't not Except have conversations. Well, it's it's ter- it's terrorism. You know, you've got to they they well, they make the campaign however they want well, it to look. But right. so, so you're telling me Turkey's gonna not trade oil for dollars? Like that's gonna, right. Okay, they're stepping out of the petrodollar deal. All right, anyway, let's get talking about some cryptocurrencies. We spent Crypto. a lot of time talking about... Randy, let's get... Let's first... We'll go over a, a quick, interesting story about hedge funds from Randy here, and then we're going to talk to Pedro about mining, and we've got more after that if uh, if you have the time to listen to us. Randy, what's going on? So there's a, there's a hedge fund in San Francisco called uh, Numeri, and it's an artificially intelligent hedge fund. Um, basically, they've developed something that masks trading data before sharing it with thousands of anonymous data scientists. Um, so they're using something like homomorphic encryption, and it works to ensure that numerous uh, numerous scientists can't see any actual details from any of the trades, but they can build machine learning models that analyze um, anonymized abstract data and theoretically learn better ways of trading stocks and other financial securities. Um, so there's several big Wall Street hedge funds that have been exploring the use of machine learning algorithms for some time, uh, but Numeria's new efforts are crowdsourcing the creation of these algorithms. Um, the founder, uh, Richard Crabe, said, anyone can submit predictions back to us, and if they work, we pay them in Bitcoin. So by using Bitcoin, the identities of the people making the predictions is masked, um, and it's getting quite popular. The, about three months ago, they had 4,500 uh, data scientists built who had built about 250,000 machine learning models uh, that did about 7 billion predictions for the fund. Now they have about 7,500 people making submissions, uh, building a total of 500,000 models that drove about 28 billion predictions. So um, they're they're competing to build wow. better models and they earn money in the process. Um, basically, they're using a, a statistics machine learning technique called stacking or uh, uh, ensembling. And it just combines the best of a myriad of algorithms to create a more powerful tool than any of the individual ones on their own. Um, but each week, a hundred scientists earn Bitcoin through Numeri, and the company pays out over one hundred fifty has paid out over one hundred fifty thousand dollars so far. And according to the founder, if the fund reaches a billion dollars under management, it would pay out over a million dollars each month to its data scientists in Bitcoin. Wow! So see that. This is, I really like the way that this is going, the whole crowdsourcing. There's a lot of different uh, viewpoints. And, and especially when it comes to this sort of nuanced stuff and prediction, you want, you want lenses that you don't even think exist. You want viewpoints that you couldn't see, right? Well, well this is going to be huge in the, in the financial industry. So the mutual fund industry is having ETFs starting to muscle in. Um, so, you know, fund managers are now competing against these ETFs that have you know, no fees. And, and what are it, ETFs? Um, Exchange traded funds. Right. So they're, they're, they're a non-managed okay. fund, right? So somebody, you know, they, they pick maybe a market or a segment of the economy. Or commodity. Commodity. And, and then that just rides and you can invest in that and you're not paying fees for, for management. Well, now, not only is that muscling in on the traditional mutual fund industry, but machine learning um, with NVIDIA really pushing their um, high-end graphics cards, you know, specially made just for compute and using these this machine learning and neural networks. And what they're doing is in the past, you know, the, the stock market, for example, is not just pure numbers. What's this company worth? What's their market segment? There's also emotion involved. Something happens in the news, you know, investors weigh their risk reward and, and make decisions. 
And a computer could never figure that part out. Well, this machine learning neural networks is starting to, you know, give insight by using a lot of historical information and using so many data points that, you know, before these high-end graphics cards, you just didn't have enough computing power to analyze. So it's going to be real interesting in the financial world in the next few years. Wow, it's, it's great. Uh, I, I, I'm not only financial, I mean, I, I see the same sort of thing for... I, I mean, everything, cross-platform, cross-medical me- medical, medical research, cancer research. Because it's how research. organisms do it, right? Think about how organisms it's, grow. Organisms are it's massively each, parallel. And, and, and it's, yes, it's a bunch of tiny cells working in parallel, and each of the cells might have a variation to how they do their technique, but only the strongest and most successful ones survive then to spread that, that, that learning, that experience. And the, the weak ones, the failures, just fail, right? So, like, like this is the same way I, I think more the more you mimic the organic structure and organic development of life uh, in a digital sense, I think the faster you're going to reach that that AI that you're, you're the movies talk about, right? But uh, let's Pedro, let's talk a little bit about, about mining, um, and we can always jump back to these topics afterwards. But we we brought you on. You, you were our original mining expert for the for the new cash show way yep. way back. When we were first uh, starting out, and you you mined, uh, what, what was your first currency you mined? I, I mined Bitcoin. Okay, I mean, that was the first thing I mined, and then I switched over to Litecoin because it just got you know easier to mine. Um, I was also in on the first you know round of the ASICs coming out. So an ASIC is a, a very specialized piece of silicon. It only does one thing, but it does it really fast. It has one job. It has one job. That's it. And when, when did you start mining? By the way. Probably in 2013, you know, early 2013. Now, the, the thing with mining is it's very speculative and it's very much based on, you know, what what opportunities are at the time. And, and when I started, I got in at a very good time. Uh, the market conditions are a lot tougher now because, I mean, who doesn't want a machine in their closet that makes them money when they sleep? We, you know, we'd all like that. Yeah. Um, so it's just gotten a lot tougher and it's, it's a lot more uh, risky to do. Uh, so, for example, you can spend twenty three hundred dollars and get one of these Ant Miner S nines, and you're making about four dollars a day. So it's going to take you over three years just to break even at at current prices, which fluctuate rapidly. Right? Well, which and actually there's the been speculation. Going up. Yeah, right. The, True. Yes, and in mining, yes. So, so Randy brings up if at the current price, which is part of the speculation, is you're calculating these, um, you know, these numbers with today's price. But what if the currency you're mining doubles in a year? Well, you're going to pay that equipment off a lot, a lot better. Sure, sure, definitely. So, you know, there's a lot in play. And, and the way I look at it today is, you know, unless this is going to be your full-time job really doing this, you'd have to go on scale. Because when the ASIC manufacturers come out with a new level of chips, just like with computers, they obsolete the old, uh, they're going to sell to their big customers. They're going to sell to their Chinese Bitcoin mining farms. And they're going to make, you know, sell a million plus dollars per sale so you there with, you know, $300, you know, you're not their priority. So somebody else's, you know, bigger scale is going gonna, is gonna to get the equipment first. So it's actually a lot more profitable to mine non-Bitcoin. Because with Bitcoin, you don't have those ASICs, so it's a little more of a level playing field. And, uh, you know, there's some um, profit calculators. So BitcoinX.com will uh, show you, you can plug in the numbers of your miner for whatever type of uh, currency you want to mine, and it'll tell you, you know, you provide how much you pay for it, how much your electricity costs, and it tells you how long it'll take for you to break even. Um, you can also do multi-currency mine. So NiceHash.com has a, a miner that will always mine the most profitable coin, and it'll switch it for you, and then it pays you out in Bitcoin. Um, so I, the way I look at mining today is if you're into computers and, like, tweaking and adjusting voltages on graphics cards, it could be a, a pretty awesome hobby. It can also be a way that you support the cryptocurrency that you believe in. Uh, so some people, you know, will mine just for that. Um, the other way to look at it is, you know, to turn a profit, and that's just a lot harder. It's not impossible, but you you really have to spend, you know, hours a day just to stay on top of it. You know, when a new version of a, um, you know, Randy told me about a new version of a miner and it, it doubled the efficiency of the mining. Well, you want to find that out like within hours. You don't want to find out in a month that that came out and you had all this lost opportunity. So it, it can be, you know, uh, time consuming. I mean, if you like doing that, that's great. 
but I would I would never recommend somebody spend thousands of dollars to buy a mining rig and and try to pay it back. No, I and and I think you stress the hobby aspect of this and that that is really important because you you need to have this love or at least interest, passion passion because it's going to be difficult, right? There's a lot of challenges involved. Now, uh, you you mentioned okay, so you mentioned starting off with ASICs and Bitcoin. And then you you mentioned altcoins and other coins that uh, were mined, and you've you've mined a series of different coins over time. Yep. Um, what was like the first altcoin you you went to? You, I think you mentioned it. it was- yeah, I started with Bitcoin, then I went to Litecoin, right? And you know, I mined a fair amount of that, and then you know, Litecoin exploded, and that was my you know one lucky break. Um, after that, I've also mined Ethereum. I'm a big uh, believer in Ethereum. I think it's uh, it's an amazing project. Uh, and I also mine Zcash, uh, totally anonymous transaction currency. So I'm I'm doing this with equipment that I bought back when it was profitable to do. I'm not, you know, spending a ton. You know, I might buy maybe a new card a year just to to play around with, but I enjoy it. You know, it's it's a hobby of mine. So now, it it, it the the mindset you're talking about, and I'm I'm trying I'm I'm sort of summarizing. So please confirm if this is true. The mindset of mining is one that you're passionate about the the idea. Then that you have a long-term strategy in mind. You're not mining so that you can flip those coins the moment they hit your account, right? Right. It, so that so that's the, the mindset I think of a like a hobbyist, an enthusiast, right? And, and and you can, you know, if you do it right, you can spend a thousand dollars, put a rig together, and pay it off within a year, and and that'll give you a lot of enjoyment if if you do it like that sort of thing. Um, but if you really wanted to make the money and you really believe that currency was going to go up, then in a year, maybe it's better to invest that thousand. So that's the other way to look at it. If if you think, well, I'm mining this currency for this price today, but I think it's going to double, well, why not just buy it? Exactly. So, you know, you have to crunch those numbers yourself. Well, and universal investment advice is don't invest more money than you can afford to lose. Yes, of course. So, and we are not advising you to buy or sell anything once again. But it, it should be noted that, so uh, I, we've talked about here in Neocash, uh, Randy and I, in our experience with uh, running an Ethereum miner, and we wanted to, um, for, for us, like we also have a media thing. So we wanted to make a video about mining, but we also had that speculative outlook. We, we thought Ethereum had such outstanding promise, and that if we got in at a certain time, uh, basically we pulled the trigger as soon as possible, then will be profitable. And, and, and I think you, you guys did break even, right? Yeah, I'm, I, I haven't sold not any eight, of it. Not at $8.40. I, I well, I mean, still, okay. Still, yes. But I, think, I think yes. It, when you, yeah, when we sell, we'll, we'll know, but I'm hodling, so. Yeah, that, that's, <laughs> well, and that's the other part is that knowing what we do with media, knowing what, what our, our interaction is on, you know, with the outlook of blockchains, that we would definitely probably use Ethereum in the future. Right, and, right. and you're helping to secure the Ethereum network. You're providing security. You're helping relay transactions. And, and if you believe in Ethereum, and I believe in Ethereum, and I enjoy mining it for those reasons as well, I you know it needs that decentralized support. Right. Uh, and now, more recently, we are doing the Zcash thing similar to yourself, and uh, it just worked out really well that the same operating system provider that did the the Ethereum mining also was able to handle the Zcash mining, and so with Ethereum's um, difficulty uh, spike coming up, mining Ethereum just doesn't make sense. Yeah, I mean, I, I throw in a plug in there for ethosdistro.com. Um, that's where we get our you know mining software. So you. You purchase, um, you purchase it from them, and they'll ship it on either an SSD or they'll just send you the license key. Uh, it, it is a piece of software I do not mind paying for. You know, these folks really made a slick unit where um, it's running under Linux, and Linux can be you know a little dicey to configure. But you basically put in a supported card, and you fire it up, and you edit one file with your uh, information for your mining pool, and away it goes. And then you know, if you want, you can tweak it further, but uh, if you have a power outage, you know, you set your, your motherboard to reboot automatically and it'll just come right back up and, and go to mining. So it, it's something, if you have an AMD or an NVIDIA uh, card, you can get this from from these folks and, you know, dual boot and, and just play around with it with the graphics card you might already have for gaming. Yep, exactly. And if you're not using it while you're at work or you're somewhere else, then it could be making money for you, but you should understand the risks 
of mining, and they're out there. The information's all out there. If you're really interested, I'm sure you could find it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you can, you can, you know, you can burn your card if you overclock it. So I, I would recommend, unless you're, you know, a seasoned expert with these sort of things, you don't want to start a, you know, a fire by overclocking the card to crazy amounts. So if you, but with this fire it, bad. Yeah, fire bad. But this is going to just come up and use the default save setting. So if you want to play around with it, it, it would be a you know it's short money. I think it's like forty dollars, and and you can play around with some mining without needing to do the heavy duty configuring that right. can be more complex. Yep. So excellent, thank you, Pedro. Uh, mining is def it's it's a challenge, but it's it's also rewarding to be a part of the future of money yeah let's, and secure, let's face it. securing the network too is just you know every additional node helps bring another ledger to the table so it helps secure the blockchain well and, and at the same time and we, we just talked about the ecb we just talked about the federal reserve it's sort of a, a way of, of, of sticking your nose out at them and saying well i can print money too so uh <laughs> and you are exactly let's let's go we got a bunch a couple more stories we want to get to it's going to be a longer episode we're already past the half an hour mark but thank you for sticking with us you can check out our blog at neocashradio.com and as always we have a show coming out every wednesday but let's talk about coinbase so we mentioned in a previous episode that the the coinbase was ordered by the fbi to hand over the records of the users they challenged it and a federal judge has it, ordered them the irs not the fbi not okay i'm sorry the irs yes now, a federal judge has ordered them to turn over the records. So, they, yeah, the thing Coinbase that, said no, and a federal judge just said no. Yes, yes, you must turn it over. There the, was new information on that today. Oh yeah, one of Coinbase's customers is suing to prevent uh, to prevent that. I'm trying to find that story. N now, it should be noted that Coinbase was going to report or had to report the fact that when your account. Uh, when you took bitcoins out of your account, it counted as a sale in, in their records, mm -hmm. right? So it doesn't matter if you actually moved it to another wallet. They considered it a sale for capital gains purposes. So if you made money between the time you acquired those bitcoins and the time you moved them out of the account, the IRS would know about that. Interesting. And so so uh, Coinbase customer files motion to block IRS from accessing user info. The motion filed today in San Francisco seeks to quash the summons. In the law, a motion to quash a summons means that the moving party, the person who files the motions, is asking the judge to set aside a prior action. So one of Coinbase's customers is now taking this to court. Cool. Good. <laughs> okay, good. Good luck. We'll keep watching it for sure. Well, Dash's first BitPay-like service has just launched, thanks to Amanda Johnson, who has also been on the Neocash Radio Show in the past. Yep. Uh, Randy, what, what's going on with that? Yeah, so there was a new video that Amanda put out yesterday on uh, Dash Detailed that uh, about SpectroCoin. Dash has just gained full merchant integration with London-based SpectroCoin. Uh, SpectroCoin has offered a Dash wallet app, a Dash exchange, and a Dash-funded debit card since June, but the recently launched merchant integration now allows merchants to offer a pay-with-Dash feature uh, at their in-person stores or on their websites, and uh the users can keep the dash or spectrocoin will allow them to option uh, allow them the option of immediately converting the dash into US dollars, euros or bitcoin for a 1% fee and uh, this is something spectrocoin has offered uh, for bitcoin users since 2013 so they're not necessarily new to the block they've been around for the while and uh, looks like a, a neat option for people who wanted to start accepting dash as a merchant service excellent and thanks and, and thanks and also kudos to Amanda Billy Rock for Still being a part of the cryptocurrency media community and doing her thing and yep. being successful. So now, now Amanda Johnson. Amanda. Oh yes, Amanda Johnson. Jeez, Amanda Billy and Amanda B. Johnson. How's that? There you go. Nice. Excellent. So Darren uh, Z. Starks. I don't know if you got a chance to look at this. We're gonna have a, a an article up on our blog that talks about Z. Starks and it's Z. K. Starks, I should say. And the article is very very long and. It has a lot of math and very involved. It very involved. Basically, explains how zero knowledge proofs work, showing how, that you know something without revealing what you know, and it talks about it in great technical detail, well beyond my own comprehension. But I think for people who are really into code and who understand a lot of these technologies behind blockchain and stuff, uh, this might be an interesting read. So we wanted to link to it. it. It's 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 almost a little difficult. I'm gonna try. I'm gonna try, and, and this might be a wrong explanation. And I, I hope if it's a wrong explanation, someone out there sends me an email at jj at neocashradio.com and tells me I'm wrong. But this is basically what I'm I'm from what I read. It 
a Z snark is basically saying, I know an equation to a problem, to an answer. Okay. So it, it says, I know the answer, of course. And then I've created, there's an equation I've created that can get this answer. And now I'm not going to show you the equation or the answer, but I'm going to show you I can solve the equation and get this answer and get the right answer by giving you these few variables that you can run yourself and some equation you can run yourself that doesn't give you the exact answer that, that I have, but it shows you that my math is good. If that's, that's my, my, my layman's way of, of explaining what a Z snark is. So it's, it's basically saying I, I have an answer, I have a number, and I'm going to make an equation that will equal that number. And then I'm going to tell you that in the equation, solve this equation, it's similar to my equation. There are some differences, but if you could solve this equation, like I solved my equation, we'll both arrive at a similar answer with the difference being the same difference that I initially gave you, right? Mm -hmm. So, so like K, the variable K is added. There and, you go. And K throughout is, is the, in the equation I give you, but in my equation, I don't have K. And so when I solve mine and you solve yours, we both solve ours in the same way. We, we, an, we end up with an answer that is a difference of K. Right. So that's what a Z snark is. Well, we talked a little bit about a them little bit. in episode 180 when uh, Zcash had just launched. Um, and they've shown that uh, they're able to do these zero knowledge proofs over Ethereum as well. And so they've been working on technology to um, bring that uh, on board as well. Yes, I think this is definitely something that uh, the Ethereum team and, and Vitalik himself are very much interested in. And I, I think will play a vital role in Ethereum going forward. Uh, but it's good to see that it's in practice and working with uh, Zcash. And as we mentioned earlier, we are mining Zcash uh, just for a full disclosure knowledge. But of course, we're not giving you advice to buy or sell Zcash. Yeah. Well, and we've got two more stories, and I, yes. I think I can wrap them up pretty succinctly. Um, there's some good charts and stuff that I'd recommend people take a look at on our website. Uh, the first story I want to talk about, it talks about welfare cliffs and why many low-income workers will never overcome poverty. Poverty, excuse me. So this is from LearnLiberty.org, and it takes a deep look at uh, what it calls a clear, thorough, fascinating, and appalling study uh, that looks at what happens when when there's a welfare cliff? And let me explain that. So if you were working a job in Chicago and you were earning $12 an hour, uh, you would be bringing home $22,000, a little around $22,000 a year after taxes. But you'd also be eligible for all kinds of uh, tax credits, food assistance, housing assistance, child care, medical assistance, all that. That would actually be worth another $41,000 combined. So your earned income per year would be about $63,500. But if you were to be offered a generous raise to say like $15 an hour, you'd be making uh, $27,572 a year, which is another $5,500 after taxes, and you'd become eligible for another premium tax credit. But your other benefits would decrease by a little over $8,000. And so your annual earned income would actually go from $63,500 to a little over $60,000. So not that big of a decrease. But if you keep performing well at your job and you get another raise to, say, $18 an hour, you'd be getting $33,000 a year after taxes. But as you may have guessed, a lot of your government assistance would go away, yielding a loss of over $26,800 worth of government benefits, which would decrease your annual earned income from $60,000 to $39,000. To actually, So to get back to the same level of earned income you once enjoyed at that $12 an hour, the $63,500, you'd have to work your way up to making $38 an hour without the government assistance. Wow. So, yeah, and this isn't unique to Chicago. This is something we see all over, and it's uh, a perverse. In there's perverse incentives in play that keep people poor and reliant on government, quote, assistance programs. Um. So. Excellent. And we got one more story that about poverty as well. Yeah. So uh, mobile money, the long run poverty and gender impacts of mobile money. This is a new study that was published in Science Magazine, and it takes a look at mobile money in Kenya. Uh, mobile money is very similar to Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies uh, in that it allows monetary value to be stored on a mobile phone and sent to other users via text messages. And it's become ubiquitous in, in Kenya. There's a company called M-Pesa, which is the most popular money platform, mobile money platform in Kenya, but it's not the only one. Um, it's used by at least one individual in 96% of Kenyan households. Um, and these people have access to 110,000 agents who can do deposit and withdrawal services compared to just 2,700 bank ATMs throughout the whole country with over 5 million households. So there's a lot more, there's a much better network for people to be able to use this. Now, this study shows that uh, M-Pesa and mobile money has actually increased 
uh, consumption levels per capita and helped lift almost 200,000 households out of poverty, so about 2% of Kenyan households. Uh, the study also takes a look at microloans that you know are often going out to, to female uh, business entrepreneurs, and they're saying that there's very limited impacts on economic outcomes with those, and in some cases there's negative impacts on business activities and subjective well-being because it's credit-based. Um, and they're saying that in contrast, more basic financial services, such as the ability to safely store, send, and transact money taken for granted in most advanced economies, uh, and which in the form of mobile money have reached millions of Kenyans at unprecedented speed over the past decade, appear to have the potential to directly boost economic well-being. So uh, it, this is you know, a tool that's helping some of the world's estimated 4 billion unbanked people climb out of poverty. Uh, Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies were not mentioned in this study, but their increased adoption absolutely could be another tool that would aid in facilitating the storage and transfer of funds, especially with international remittance payments and things like that. So, Well, I uh, do believe M-Pesa has a Bitcoin uh, integration at some point. I, we've, we've covered that in the past mm -hmm. about their involvement with Bitcoin. And ultimately, what you're saying, you know, is is basically that Bitcoin or an all, or a cryptocurrency, a a individually controlled uh, currency like that, could uh, help definitely lift poverty pe stricken people out because they they don't have a bank otherwise, they don't have a way to send and transact. And uh, right. was launched in uh, 2007. That's even before Bitcoin. Yeah, um, and uh, the micro loans uh, a good a good place for that is Kiva dot org. Mm -hmm. um, I I have an account there, and you know you can select who you want to give that loan to, and it's micro loans, and it helps people, you know, be entrepreneurs and and get small businesses started. Well, it's an interesting study, and I, I definitely recommend people take a look at it, and it delves far further into uh, how it affects men versus women in, in these developing countries as well. So. Well, thanks so much for joining us this uh, episode, Pedro. It's been a pleasure. Well, thank you, JJ. Thank you, Randy and, uh, and Dr. Dapp. Mm, yep. Excellent. Well, we, we uh, will definitely keep you up to date on mining as it goes forward. But unfortunately, it's such a, a nuanced and large field at this point because of all the coins and technology that if you really want to learn about it, it's something that you're going to have to put into time yourself. Go to the forums. Yeah, exactly. Go to the forums and uh, find out that way. Uh, just a reminder that you can tune in to Neocache Radio every Wednesday night. Don't want to miss a single moment of awesome Neocache content, including special episodes and bonus interviews. Subscribe to our podcast on Google Play Music, iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, YouTube, Podcast Addict, LBRY, and more. This is JJ, Darren, and Randy for Neocache Radio, where we discuss the future of money today. NeocacheRadio.com.